wow, this conference. You know, I'm, I'm actually really relieved because I prepared my, my talking points and I'm noticing that nothing we've heard until now directly contradicts anything I'm about to say. So <laughs> that feels good. But I feel I've learned so much over the past couple of days. And so thank you all, Carla, for organizing it, Andrew, for coming all the way. It's extraordinary. So thank you. Um, there are two, thing, two areas that I'd like to cover today, and they're both related to family interventions, and I think that's how we're going to sort of cap the conference. The first one are some observations that are born from um, my work, my recent, my, my extensive work with family members over the past few years, um, a lot through family connections, but also through my, my work, as well as um, from my current work with adolescents, I work at the Yale Psych Hospital in an intensive uh, outpatient program with children and adolescents, really, and their families. And so those observations come from, from that as well. And then what I'd like to do when I, and, and this will be pretty brief. I mean, it would take a long time to go over those observations in a great deal of detail. I'll talk a little bit about my interventions with families, my clinical interventions with families, but that will be really short also. And then I'd like to spend a few minutes talking to you about this absolutely extraordinary program that you've started to hear about that was co-authored by Perry and by Dr. Frizzetti over 10, 12, 15 years ago, 15 years ago that we call Family Connections um, that has grown to being uh, present in 17, 19 countries now. So uh, we'll talk a little bit about that. Oh, how did we get... Oh, no, that's my slide. All right, that's your presentation. No, it's all right. I just got confused because I see your slides there, but as long as it's my slides, I'm good. Thank you. Yeah, I'll be good with the clicker. That will click this one, yes? All right. Thanks. So, um, as I was thinking about um, how I've started to consider work with family members, I um, realized that uh, I was almost sort of shifting the paradigm of treatment, and I'd like to tell you a little bit about, a little bit more about that, but I'd like to start with um, a story I read recently that really, to me, captured what I mean by this shift in paradigm. Uh, it's, a, it's a report about a project that has been done, a study that has been done, and that was done um, in 1986, so 30 years ago, by a team of researchers who, um, from the University of West Indies who decided that they were going to embark on a study aimed at identifying the impact of various interventions on the young children of families who are burdened with extreme poverty. So they gathered 130 families and they broke them up into three groups. And those families were all from the poorest areas of uh, Kingston in Jamaica, and uh, the three groups were divided as follows. The first group was offered weekly interventions by trained researchers on parenting skills, reading to the kids, uh, playing with them, interacting with them. Now remember, those families were extremely poor families. They were not selected for lack of parenting skills. Right? But that was the intervention in the first group. The intervention in the second group was weekly. The families received a kilogram of uh, milk-based nutritional supplements, and the third group received nothing. And the interventions lasted for two years, but the results have been examined ever since, so it's been 30 years now. And the only group whose babies and toddlers um, showed a difference 30 years later was group one. Group one, the people who, the families who received those interventions um, in terms of parenting skills, the children and the babies who now are all grown up showed um, uh, improved social skills, lessened aggressive behaviors as they were growing up and as they are adults, higher IQs, and on average, 25% higher income now that they are adults and working, <coughs> right? 
So this experiment, as I said, was not conducted based on parenting skills. It was based on families who suffered from this huge psychosocial stressor that extreme poverty can be. And so my question is, when we think of this other extreme psychosocial stressor that mental illness represents, where should the intervention really be? Now, where should we intervene, especially when we're trying to intervene early? So yesterday, Suhei, almost in passing, said something that I caught about how our Western culture is uh, very individualistically focused, how we look at people. And um, to illustrate that comment, I would like to, okay, let me see if this is working, yes. I would like to show you these slides, a couple of slides, that we very often show when we talk about borderline, but my purpose is not to show you those facts, you all know those facts. It's to show you how patient-focused the facts are, right, when we talk about individuals, right? So we're talking about how BPD is environmentally induced. It's like the patient and the environment comes to the patient, right? Or patients do not choose to have BPD. Or 40% of patients were previously diagnosed with, so very patient focused, very much on the person. Same here, we talk about recovery, we talk about after a certain number of years and whether they remain in uh, recovery, and yet, when um, what, what, we, what we do know about BPD is that, as Dr. Gunderson says, it is the interpersonal dysfunction of BPD that offers the best discriminator for the diagnosis, right? So we're back into this interpersonal dysfunction. And indeed, emotional cues of the illness do not affect borderline patients in the same way that the interpersonal cues do. So recently I was working with, of course I changed his name, um, and I changed it to Tim, but I was working with Tim. Um, he was referred to our day hospital after a violent uh, behavior towards his mother who insisted that he go to school. Now the real reason for his hospitalization is that he grew up because he had been resisting going to school for a long time, and he had been aggressing his mom for a long time, but he was little so she could contain him. And now he'd grown up, and she couldn't contain him anymore, right? So when you look at this chart, so here's Tim in the middle in the red circle. Um, but think about his environment. Now what he had going for him was he, what he has going for him is that he is a great hockey player. So that's a big positive, right? But he shuts down. He's very afraid of his aggressive impulse, impulsivity. And so it's so easy for his peers, see that big circle of peers, to get him going. All they have to say is a couple of things, and he has this reaction where he sort of shuts down, puts his, leg, his head between his legs, so his glasses sort of fall over, and he fumbles for them, and that cracks everybody up, and it's really sad. It's, but, you know, so that's his interaction with a lot of peers. And then there's school. Because he sometimes acts out, Right, well, he gets punished. And how do you think they punish him? They say, you can't go to hockey. You have to work instead. You have to do your homework. You have to attend the class that you missed. Right, so that gets taken. So that circle right there. And then his mom is very supportive. She's a single mom. She's very supportive, and she really cares a lot. She doesn't get this, though. She wants him to go to school. He is capable. He is a smart kid. So from her perspective, while well, school comes first, she also uses treatment as a coercive way, as a threat, and as a coercive way to get him to school. If you don't go to school, if you don't do what you need to do, then I'll have to send you to the IOP. Not really helpful, right? And then you've got the others. He's been quote unquote fired from therapy twice already. So when you look at all this interaction, you know, it's not just the family and the patient, it's the, patient, the identified patient and everything that goes around him. And so is it any wonder that this kid likes to go to his room and play video games all day? Which is really when he presented what he thought his problem was. I'm in my room and I play video games all day. So if the interpersonal functioning is a core part of the dysfunction, well then it makes perfect sense that Tim wants nothing to do with any of that. 
And so in this whole group of others, when we think about who are frontline 24 seven, well then it's Tim's mom, right? It's the family, it's the caregivers. Those are the people who are, as we mentioned yesterday, who are tasked with taking this child home from the hospital and turning them into somebody who can function in society. And his mom is genuinely trying hard to do that and pretty much failing at it at this point. So what we're talking about trying to do is to shift our views from families being the source of the, being seen as the source of the problem, which was very, very true, what, 10, 15 years ago, uh, with all the stigma that comes with it, with all the limitations in understanding of the illness and in the treatment of the disorder, and of course, the limitations in the ability to be helpful and supportive, because there's no knowledge around that, to in more cases now, families as part of the solution, in more cases, but far from most cases. Families are still very much kept at a distance, in great part because it's hard, you know, don't know how to include them. So, um, so despite some goodwill, um, oftentimes families are not. So that's what I mean by shifting the treatment paradigm. What I mean is that, thinking back about Dr. Gunnarsson's uh, statement on interpersonal factors, if instead of treating people, we make a mindful effort to target that, the interpersonal dysfunction, right? It doesn't mean we're changing anything to what we're doing. We're still providing treatment to the families and to the patients. But the idea, what we target really, is that interpersonal dysfunction. Then we become able to get past the stigma and the blame that is on both sides, right? And we get past the suffering because the suffering is alone. And instead, we get to hope. So what we see, or at least in my experience, what I see is that a lot of the emotions, and you see them on both sides, what is going on for the families and what is going on for the, uh, for the patients, for the kids and the teenagers, are very aligned. There is fear on the part of families for what will happen to their child. There is fear on the part of the kids for what is going on with them. They know something is wrong. You know, there's a lot of confusion on both sides. The helplessness is all over the place. Nobody has skills. Nobody knows what to do. The shame is a really interesting one. There is a lot of stigma. There is a lot of shame. As Andrew said, it amounts to outright discrimination, right? There is shame on the part of fa family members. I think you alluded to that earlier, Christina, of not being able to fix it for your kid. I mean, what kind of a mom am I if I can't help my child? Yeah, so there is that shame. And there is shame that I so often see in kids who know that they are problematic in their families and who are fighting that very actively, who don't want to even go there. It's, it's heavy, it's heavy. So when we look at, um, at those uh, emotions, those very negative, powerful emotions that are, are aligned, if we're able to point, we as clinicians, as treaters, if we're able to point out how they are aligned, how yes, you are scared, but I am scared too. And so much of that is really going on. Now you've got a common language, and that's where the hope comes from. And in fact, research actually bears that. Um, Alan Frizzetti recently said, and it really stuck in my mind, the presence of one validating individual in the life of a person with the symptoms of borderline personality disorder, just one person, is the only single predictor of wellness for that person. But treating togetherness, because that's what that paradigm shift I'm offering, is not easy. It's hard. It's hard for a variety of reasons. It's actually, and that also is something that Alan talks about very fluently, how it's really a wonder that we human beings get along, that we understand each other so well, that we're able to function most of the time, right, together. But when you've got this exquisite sensitivity and this huge reactivity, 
it's, you know, one of the sentences that parents really respond well to is this, you can go from blue skies to hurricane in a nanosecond. It just explodes. And that's not normative, right? So when you've got that in the picture, well, it's a whole lot harder to treat the togetherness. It's so explosive and instantaneous. And then there's all the envir environmental factors that we know so well. But I will tell you, parents, families, caregivers, they really are motivated. And I think you already heard it in Christina's uh, talk this morning. We're looking at all these negative emotions. And really, as treaters, what we're trying to do is take those emotions and replace them with the positive emotions of love and of curiosity and of empathy. And parents are sort of, I mean, most, not malevolent parents, of course, but, but most parents are hardwired to do that. That's what we want to do, really. We want to love our kids. And we want to be able to do that in an adaptive way. All right. So parents are motivated. And at times, what you will see is that they are motivated by their own suffering. And that's totally appropriate. That suffering is enormous. And they need the kind of validation, understanding, and support for that suffering. That suffering makes sense. There's a lot of uh, grief that comes along with having somebody who suffers that much in your, in your family and whose uh, pain you cannot remove as a parent. So I am going to show you just a couple of quick charts uh, from a study that Perry did uh, 15 years ago, 15 years ago, a family perspective survey that shows the level of emotions and the breadth of emotions that uh, family members of people with BPD struggle with, right? And so you see the family stigma and the level of burden. And this is compared with, correct me if I'm wrong, Perry, with people who have access one, family members of people who have access one disorders versus borderline personality disorder. And so here's the grief, the depression, and this is among parents versus people who are not parents. So the grief is very profound, the burden. And adding to the suffering that we see is the general lack of understanding that, um, that people experience. I mean, Andrew, you said, you know, talk to 10 therapists or 10 psychiatrists, and you will get 11 answers. It's so true in families, too. You ask the grandparent, and they'll tell you to just tough love. Come on, tough love, right? And then you talk to somebody else, and they say, let them be. Just, you know, give them a break a little bit. Advice is different all over, and you sort of don't know why, right? So you see parents who are, who intuitively know that they have a role to play in this whole thing, but have no idea what is going on, and they have no idea how to even attempt to fix this. So the lack of understanding and support comes from their environment, and sadly, their experience, I, I'm noticing that their experience with our profession is, is not very positive. You know, most of the time people come and say, I've, I've never really heard an explanation about what was going on. So when we look at the, ex the most extreme stressors that mental health providers uh, report when they're working with borderline personality disorder patients, suicide attempts and threats of suicide and violence, in my observation, there is another one that ranks all the way up there. A huge stressor for, um, for family members is when they have a child who has borderline personality disorder, and that child has children. And they have some contact or no contact with the children, and they feel that their grandchildren are at risk, and they have very little power over what is going on. That's a huge stressor. And so if you treat some, a family who has a situation like that, there's a lot of work to be done to validate and support on, uh, along that, um, that, that area. So this is a quote that we hear most often in family connections. If only we had known. And that quote, I'm betting that everybody here who has been or taught a family connections class has heard this, right? Um, 
And it can convey a sense of guilt or a sense of regret. And regret is not unhealthy. Yes, it would be nice if only they had known, if only they had known. And at the same time as we talked about yesterday, here they are, no way. 10 minutes? OK, I'm going to move really fast. <laughs> I'm actually not going to move really fast. I am going to jump ahead and tell you just to, OK, you have that slide. I don't need to go over it. I think we've heard this yesterday and today. As I said, I'm glad to see that it doesn't contradict anything we've heard. This gives you a sense of what parents observe from their perspective in terms of symptoms at different ages. Something else that is really important, um, Andrew, I liked your words of restricted repertoire of uh, descriptors on the part of parents. You know, it's hard when you don't know the words to explain uh, defiance and how defiance is different than disobedience, right? So when you have a child who is defiant, but you don't know how to explain that, well, it looks like disobedience. And it's very profoundly different. So more normative behaviors are in blue there. Um, and the less normative behaviors are in orange. And we see some of the, um, some of the dialectics that, that we're playing with that. With. So how do we treat? How do we target the relationship? Well, we keep an eye on promoting hope. So we try to infuse the sensitive and reactive kids with skills, DBT how, or other treatment that is uh, an effective treatment. And then we try to help families with family skills. And that's what Family Connections does. There's a little bit of DBT in Family Connections, but Family Connections is really mostly very solid family skills. We highlight alignment anytime we can in emotions, in goals, in any accomplishment, in any effort. So the validation that we treaters know to do with kids, well, now we're going to do that with the parents, and then we're going to do that with the two of them together, or the family together. We do remind families frequently that staying in the game is key. This is a study that Perry did um, a while back on expressed emotion. We explain to families that they can have a roadmap but that getting upset, losing their cool, is OK. And that what's important is to stay in the game. And we teach them how to stay in the game. So I will quickly give you my three uh, favorite slides for actual treatment of families. This one I don't, generally don't show families. I um, only have my patients for six to eight weeks. So I'm lucky if I get to see the families for three sessions, maybe. But uh, I immediately keep in mind what the polarity is, uh, is what polarity is presenting. So when I have the family in front of me, I'm thinking, all right, how do they see their kid? Do they see their kid as a villain, or do they see their kid as a victim? Um, what kind of polarity am I seeing in terms of uh, evaluation of behaviors? Are they catastrophizing the behaviors or are they minimizing the behaviors? I have this chart practically memorized. It's, Perry, is your name on this? Because it's your chart, right? But I have this chart memorized and um, that helps me teach them how to keep the middle path, right? To sort of bring, bring them back to center. That second one, is really helpful for parents to understand. It's actually sort of one of the foundational uh, discussions that, that explains to parents why guilt is really not justified in their circumstances. But I do start to bring in the environmental part in an obviously completely non-judgmental way. And then this chart, which is part of the Family Connections chart, um, uh, the Family Connections curriculum, is, uh, is sort of my ace. This is a chart that truly, I mean this, uh, makes fathers cry when they sort of see what has been going on and what they've done that didn't work. And one time made a mom sort of leap out for a chair and hug me and say, I love you, now I get it. If you can take family members through this chart, their eyes will light up with recognition of what is going on. And so very quickly, because it is such a powerful chart, always try to use an example, start with the event, and explain how an event in the life of their relative 
will cause a heightened emotional arousal. I mean, we all know that, right? And then the judgments will increase the arousal, uh, but it doesn't have to happen right there and then. And they, as parents, when their kid comes home a few hours later, well, then the emotional arousal explodes. And that's what they, as family members, are seeing. They're seeing an inaccurate expression. I often show that chart in front of the person who struggles with the symptoms, and I quickly say that inaccurate is from our perspective, from the perspective of families. To them, it's completely accurate. They are very upset, so the blow up makes sense. But from the family member's side, it is inaccurate. It doesn't represent the emotion that caused the <coughs> dysregulation. And then I talk about the invalidating responses that make perfect sense in light of what is going on. Very quickly, I also point out that it's a chain and that like all chains, it's only as strong as the weakest link, and that they as family members only have that little spot, the last arrow before invalidating responses. If they can manage to learn to be validating, they're cutting the chain. I also hasten to say that in treatment, their kid is learning all the types of stuff that they need to do to manage their judgments, to manage their emotional arousal, to become more accurate in their communication, um, to tolerate the distress. So it becomes very clear that their kid is working on a lot of stuff. All we're asking them to do is this one thing, but please do it. You know, and, and generally parents get very engaged at that level. It gives them a sense of, of control. You know? All right, so what do I have, five minutes? <laughs> That's totally fine. That's totally fine. So family connections. I think family connections is what comes in at stage two when families are already suffering quite a bit and they have looked around and they found us either by sheer luck, which was your case, Christina, it was my case way back when, or uh, by looking online or find, you know, but there's a want and a desire to change already. It's a little different when you bring in parents who bring their child and say, fix him. You know, then you have to sort of try to convince them to get, to, to, to get involved. But family connections um, it, it generally has parents who are really wanting to participate in this. Um, the class was a lifeline for us when we were very, very low and not completely understanding our daughter and her issues. Our life together today would not have been possible without the skills and understanding we acquired. The class lifted the curtain of ignorance about this illness and exposed it to the light. And this was from a class about five years ago in, uh, in Wisconsin. So Family Connections was developed by Alan Frizzetti and by Perry. Um, uh, and it's a 12-week, uh, very structured, manualized class. It is parent-led. And we're very lucky that uh, many clinicians are also helping lead the class. It is more effective when it is led. I, when I say parent, I mean relative. It is more effective when relatives are actually leading the class because having been there makes such a difference. It is free. We offer it for free. And NEA is an all-volunteer organization, which is what allows us to do that. It does integrate some DBT principles of acceptance and change and of mindfulness. Um, and, um, and the, okay, so let me not forget, because I always forget to do this. The way you encourage your families to sign up is on the NEABPD website, neabpd.com. There's a families tab. Sign up takes about two minutes. It's, it's very um, easy and, and practical. Um, there are a few studies on family connections that actually show the, the effectiveness both immediately as the class finishes, uh, in terms of burden, oh, let me show you the slide directly, okay. In terms of burden, uh, grief, uh, stress, and then the last one, which goes up, is a feelings of empowerment. So orange is before, yellow is immediately at the end of the 12-week class, and then green is six months later. So the skills not only continue to accumulate, but the outcomes continue to accumulate. Um, so the class is structured, it's 12 weeks, there are six modules, um, and the modules cover uh, a variety of skills, uh, but there are three major sort of parts to the class. 
or three major part, um, yeah, th three major parts, three pillars, if you will. One is relationship mindfulness, teaching family members to pay attention, to start looking at what is going on. And that's probably very close to what you, dis you discussed, Chris, is mentalization. You know, what am I thinking? What is my kid thinking? What is going on here? So relationship mindfulness is a big, big part. The second big part, I'm going off slides now. It's all in your slides, but I just want to finish on time. The second big part is radical acceptance. Family members are fighting. You know, they're fighting. They had this vision for their kid that they were going to become you know, they're academically so smart, of course they were going to go to college, or um, they were such a talented dancer, of course they will make a career in that field. Letting go of that is really hard. Learning radical acceptance is something that is so well done in the context of group. And then the third part, which we keep for the end, even though it's so important, is validation. But it's nice to keep validation towards um, the end of the class because by then people have acquired quite a few skills and they're able to put validation in place um, perhaps more effectively. So Family Connections offers support, it offers skills, and it offers a lot of psychoeducation. The chart that I showed you earlier is um, described in there, not in a chart format, but it is very central for people to understand what is going on with their child, and same thing. It's like literally turning a light switch off. I do want those of you who are clinicians here to remember that family members don't come at this from a book. You know, their kid is fine. They know that there's something a little odd or strange going on, but their kid is basically fine. And then one day their kid is not fine. And it's a mess, and it's a really hard mess to understand. It's really hard to tease apart what the behaviors are. So clarifying what is going on, validating what is happening for them, and then taking them to, you can handle this, and these are the skills, and this is the roadmap, is really the magic of family connections. I think I have covered pretty much... I will go to the last slide. So I've discussed all of this for you guys, but I'm glad that you have them. Um, a few words for, uh, for therapists in, to, to end with. Uh, go slow with families. Just because they get it, you know, the patterns are pretty entrenched, and change is hard. But they need the cheerleading. They need the encouragement. Work in small steps and teach dialectics. Now, one of the, my ways of teaching dialectics is to sort of encourage, and then again, you know, so they make a statement, and then instead of reframing the statement, I let them reframe it by saying, and then again, so we have this little game going, and then again. Modulate the family engagement. You know, they've been functioning at really high levels of uh, fire, um, either explosions or implosions for a while. So try to bring down the explosions, try to bring up the implosions. Try, I think, Chris, in your role play, you were demonstrating that. It's tr trying to keep the fire burning, but at a low level. Don't, don't let it burn too high. And encourage finding time to discuss neutral topics. Encourage neutral activities. Encourage texting. You know, things that bring the emotions down. And then finally, encourage involvement on both sides. And you can do that as a therapist by being incredibly warm and validating to the part of the dyad who is engaging in any given moment and modeling for the others what needs to happen. All right. So those are my observations and suggestions. Family connections, huge intervention for families. What did we say, Perry? Uh, we saw Bruce Cuthbert recently, and we said family connections ultimately is a grassroots program that is currently taking the place of treatment. And that's exactly what it is. It's, it's, if, if families are open to it, you know, I send everybody to Family Connections. So, all right, so that's it. Thank you for listening, thank you.